Hello, my name is David Frimmer and welcome to our program. Winston Churchill is purported to have once said, we shape our buildings, thereafter our buildings shape us. With me today is Pastor Jim Chell, who has shaped a lot of Lutheran buildings, which in turn have shaped the ELCIC and its mission in Canada. Jim was born in the United States and was, in his words, an immigrant to Canada. His father and uncle were pastors in Minnesota. Jim went to Gustavus Adolphus College and later on to Augustana Seminary in Rock Island, Illinois. Jim interned as a student in Norman in Northern Ontario near Kenora. Jim then decided to stay in Canada after he was ordained in 1960. He accepted a pastoral call to a very small congregation at Staveley, Alberta. While there, he began a new mission congregation in High River, which continues to this day. Later, he would serve in Wetaskiwin, Alberta, where he was involved with the Mulhurst camp, and later moved to First Lutheran in downtown Calgary, where Jim says he was exposed to the opportunities and challenges of urban ministry. In the mid-1970s, Jim became assistant to the Bishop of the Western Canada Synod of the Lutheran Church in America with responsibility for developing mission congregations and projects. In 1985, he was appointed director of the Division for Canadian Missions of the newly formed Evangelical Lutheran Church in Canada. Jim, welcome to our program. It, it's nice to be with you again. Well, thank you. It's little bit beyond my expectation and capacity at this point. Wow. But if Winston Churchill was talking about buildings shaping us, I don't want to talk about buildings. <laughs> I want to I want to talk about people. Right. Because it's 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 people that shape the mission of the church. Right. It's the people that shape the people of Christ. Yeah. And that's kind of the end of the story. Well, let's get on to talking about some of the people that in your life. Maybe we can start when you first started out. I, you've said that your father and your uncle were pastors. Did they have any influence on you uh, uh, and your decision to accept the call to become a pastor? Yeah, I got four cousins that are pastors too. Wow. I suppose everything says if you believe in Jesus, you'll be a missionary. Mm -hmm. And I thought, well, I'll do Christ's mission, but I'll do what I'm trained to do. Not only that, I had a passion for the North, yeah. for, for fishing, for trees, for the ground, the out of doors. And so my seminary years, my first year was was fine. I was I was partially training to be an engineer, but it was my when, you in when you were in school, was, you were training to be an engineer. This was at Gustavus. Yeah. And I my my advisor was an engineer out of General Motors. And mm -hmm. He says, I I don't think you I don't think you make a happy bit of an engineer. You got lots of abilities, but you're interested in people too. Yeah. He said, why don't you put a fork in the road? So I stuck a fork in the road yeah. and, and, and studied sociology and got a degree in sociology. So tell me a little bit, Jim, about how that influenced you, because you became very involved in working with people with other, from other cultures as well, right? So how is sociology uh, formative for you? Oh, gee, I don't know. Do you want to hear that story? Sure, I do. <laughs> uh, okay, I went to seminary for the first year, and I, I can't say I was reluctant. I was willing, but I thought, well, let's see what this is. Then comes matriculation at the end of the first year. And the Dean Conrad called me in and he says, Jim, he says, we've looked at your personality profile, the Minnesota multiphasic, and uh, 
I got to tell you something. I says, what do you want to tell me? He, he says, well, I don't think you'll be happy as a pastor. <laughs> and I says, why, why, why do you say that? Are you, you telling me to quit? He says, no, I'm just warning you. <laughs> and I says, I'll tell you what. I'll go one more year. And we'll see how it is then. Mm -hmm. So that summer, I I was married then, of course. You always got married before you went to the seminary or, or after. Mm -hmm. But anyway, my wife and I lived in Rock Island. But uh, the, the, the Council of Churches in the U.S. was advertising for chaplains for various scout camps. Right. And, I applied for the, the Chicago Council camp up in Ludington, Michigan, about 10,000 acres. I mean, this is a huge camp. Mm -hmm. so, so, so I went there, and my wife and I slept in a tent all winter, all summer, mm -hmm. and, and did what we did among the Jewish people, because there were a lot of Jewish kids in, at those camps. So I had my I looked after kids that were lonely and homesick and needed care. And I had a service on Sunday and usually most of my congregation was, was not Christian, but it was fun. I went fishing with the doctor for maybe four mornings a week and, and started to build relationships with people who were different than, than my Swedish pietism. Mm -hmm. So that was a that was an adjustment that has social implications for the mission of the church in the future. So I went back to the seminary for another year with and and then an internship. And I thought, well if, if I'm not going to be happy in the ministry like it is, my dad and this Minnesota stuff and how the church is developing down here with such great strength, uh, I want to go to Canada yeah. where the oh, a lot of trees and a lot of space and a young country after all. I became an immigrant, yeah. an immigrant to, to, to Canada. Yeah. And I asked to go to an internship. And they very gladly sent me to Canada because that was considered to be the Siberia yeah. of the church. So tell me, a, tell us a little bit about your internship then. You you went to a, take an internship near Kenora. And, uh, yeah, yeah. And there well, was Kenora, a... A famous road trip, I understand, where you also went to Edmonton. Maybe you could tell us a little bit about about those those experiences. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Kenora had these two small parishes, parishes, one in Norman and one in Lac Lune. One was open country. People used to come to church on snowshoes, and you know, it was a cold winter. And that winter, our our son was was born. And uh, uh, first year I ever got to cut a Christmas tree. <laughs> that was that was great. And the old guy that took me was about eighty, and he he was from Sweden, mm -hmm. Isaac Solgren, and he became a good friend. Yeah. And I. I found out some good relationships with people. Mm -hmm. uh, it wasn't your typical congregation. There were poor kids in the neighborhood. I, I cut hair for them, AD kids, and yeah. I discovered how they, how they lived along the river. And I had a, it were only a few f flushing toilets in our town. Mm -hmm. So that's the way it was. It was pretty tough. It, it was pretty tough. Anyway, my my supervisor was in Kenora, Floyd Johnson, and 
And he said there's a, a youth convention in, in Edmonton. He said, are you willing to take a group of youth? I said, yeah, but not in my car. And he says, well, Charlie Bergman, he's got a Buick that's only about a year old. He says, if you take the kids, you could use his car. And there's a credit card in the golf compartment. <laughs> so, so there was. So you were uh, off to Edmonton. Off to Edmonton. Earl Trish had a son in it. Edmonton, he wanted to go. And then the other kids were from from Kenora. I think we were five kids and me in that car and we took off. We stayed in churches along the way or parsonages. So we got to know what the church was like. And I got to Edmonton. I met Don Schobert for the first time at the conference. And it was at his church. And after the, the, the event was over, uh, I asked the kids, have any of you been to the mountains? Yeah. And none of them had. I said, do you want to go? Let's go take the big circle and go home. And so after all, we had a credit card. Yeah. <laughs> and so... And Trudy Schoberg's dad had just gotten a resort in Jasper and mm -hmm. was opening up and she phoned him and they offered us to stay there on our way. So off we went to Jasper and, and we stayed there one night and then it was only a bell of a road between Jasper, Lake Louise and Banff. So that was a really adventure. That's a pretty we, beautiful part of the country. The, the, the young people had not been in that. Yeah, yeah right. So, so it was it was a it was a good trip. We stayed in Calgary at a new mission in Calgary, and then we went on to Regina mm -hmm. State. Can't remember where was Regina. I think in. A pastor's house, and I forget who was there. And then we went on to Winnipeg, and 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 when I went on home, but so that in was some uh, in some ways you introduced these young people not only to the church but to Canada itself. Yeah, yeah, right. One of the one of the boys in the trip uh, became a an engineer. And I think David Troyce became an architect. Mm -hmm. And one of the girls ended up in Alberta and met her later. Mm -hmm. And she was she was chairman of the Christian Ed Committee in the Senate. Mm -hmm. And so that was, you know, it was good relationships. Mm -hmm. But uh, then, then I got back to Kenora and pastor said the kinsman's camp hasn't been used do you want to would you want to take some kids camping out there <laughs> so i got about about 30 kids i hired a cook and i i phoned at cobi and cam rose and got bob pearson to be the i guess preacher mm -hmm. and uh so we we had a camp there, yeah. and and that was a that was a good experience. And it, it was so, the emphasis wasn't so strong on on, on Bible teaching, but but but, but relationships. Mm -hmm. And then one morning, one morning, a a bear came into camp, <laughs> and and a form the lands and forests, and they sent a guy out with a gun, and he was waiting for the bear to come back, and she didn't come back, so he put the gun on top of the fridge in the kitchen and, and says, shoot the bear if it comes, and so sure enough, he went to home to work, and the, the bear came. I took a shot, 
with a bear team, stuck its head out of the brush, and I missed it. The problem was I'd never shot a, a 30 30 rifle before, and I, I hadn't shot that gun. I was usually a pretty good shot. And so I thought, oh, well, scared, scared her off and, and went back to have our devotions for the day. And all of a sudden, one of the kids hollered, hey, pastor, there's a bear here. And so I said, tell the kids to stay in. And, and so they did, and the bear poked her nose out of another set of bushes. And I took careful aim, and it only took one shot to do it in, because I got her straight in the heart. Yeah. Anyway, so uh, there was quite an adventure, the camping experience. You, you had a, this sounds like an extensive yeah. youth ministry you had here. Well, <laughs> I don't know. That's the way we did things. <laughs> I butchered the bear. I never butchered an animal before. Yeah. I cut the loins off it, part of the hams, and I, I went and asked Mrs. Prouty, I says, Do you cook bear meat? She said, Sure. <laughs> so so we had bear meat for the whole camp that day and blueberry pie, because we got out in the bush and picked blueberries the day before. Wow. Anyway, that sounds, that's that sounds like an exciting an exciting time. Um, yeah, yeah. I, it I strikes me though that one of the things that's the, the for you relationships are everything, right? Building relationships, helping people learn how to have relationships. Yeah, important yeah. That's where I, that's where I ended the, the story, like I told you. But that's not the whole story. You asked me about sociology. Well, sociology has to do with people mm -hmm. and people relationships. Yeah. And I, my first experience with Aboriginal people in Canada was, was there. Mm -hmm. The ladies nursing their babies on the steps of the restaurants yeah. because they wouldn't let them in. Really? About people digging out of the garbage cans mm -hmm. or food. And this is a rich tourist town mm -hmm. where the rich came out to their islands yeah. and enjoyed the finer things of, 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 of life. When you think about it, the sociology of it, yeah, I sure soon discovered the disparity, disparity in, in, mm -hmm. in, even in Canada. Yeah, and in terms of the neighborhood, mm -hmm. in terms of the Aboriginal people, mm -hmm. and in terms of myself, I was an immigrant. Yeah. In the mid nineteen seventies, you joined the staff of the Western Canada Synod as assistant to the bishop and regional director for the Board of American Missions. What were some of the memorable mission developments that you were involved in during this time? Well, in the, in the 70s, there was an immigration of people of Chinese background. And it was quite a heavy number. In fact, the third language in Canada at that time was, was Chinese or some derivation where it had been Italian. And I mean, that's a, that, that has had a, a profound effect on society. And as far as the Chinese people were concerned, we had some obligation because when I was a kid, back in those days, as a Lutheran pietist, we're great supporters of, of missionary activity. And uh, a mission to China, a missionary to China, stayed in our home, going to St. Cloud Teachers College as a part of her training. So I got a, we got acquainted to some Chinese food. Well, and it had to do with a, a relationship with, with, with Minnie Tech, who was the. Uh, 
the Swedish missionary mm -hmm. to, to China. Mm -hmm. Anyway, that was an introduction in my in my youth. So that wasn't at all strange for me to 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 be welcoming to to Chinese people. Mm -hmm. And the trick was to build relationships oh, because some of the people coming over to Canada were product of that mission mm -hmm. of the Lutheran pietists who were so fond of liturgy and, 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 and the, the depths of our articulating theology. But they were strong believers in the gospel. And so it was a matter of how did they fit into the Lutheran church here when they're looked down upon by Canadian pastors for not being Lutheran? Mm -hmm. well, well, what does that mean to be a Lutheran? Well, that's it was certainly a challenge. And it was interesting to, to work with the Chinese people and to go to their church council meetings when they had them mm -hmm. and, 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 and work with their issues, which were usually in Chinese. And I was called upon even to preach occasionally in a, among a, a congregation, mm -hmm. a newly developed one. There was one of the first ones that was in Vancouver. And I think we ended up with 14 by the time I left. Mm -hmm. But they were they were so different because different parts of of Asia have so many different Asian cultures, both in terms of language and history and so forth. So as immigrants do, they 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 come together in their own comfortable groups. Yeah. So the Swedes did the same thing. Norwegians and the Germans and the Danes, they all kept their culture, their church culture. And so how do you build this bridge among some of the immigrant people too? So you I thought, well, well... You were pretty well already knew about the Chinese culture in some respects, or at least knew what you didn't know and were open to learning more and were able to build a connection to them. Well, yeah, I worked, I, I worked at that. So tell me a little bit about what were, um, how, many, like, how many congregations were there, these Chinese congregations, and how did they, how did they fit in? Did they, were they, did they feel part of the Lutheran community in Western Canada? Well, that was my concern. How did they integrate in the church, and why doesn't the, how can the church honor them right. and respect who, who they are? And they had a hard time among themselves. Mm -hmm. Like the people from from Taiwan, they were they were different because Taiwan was separated from mainland China, right. and they were looked down upon by. Um, was a part of communism yeah. that was in, in mainland China. Yeah. And then there was another group in Taiwan which had been the farmers. And they were they were the people who were oh, what's their, their name now? There's, there's a lot of them in Taiwan. Mm -hmm. Well, anyway, there was that group that was the, the, the name of the group, or they called them the guests. Yeah. They, they, they were never really settled any place. Okay. And then That's you had the people. Yeah, so this, this was a, 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 a picture of, of, of what our own culture was. Right. Like when you colonize a country, country the way us Swedes, had colonized North America, that was every, every culture is done the same, yeah. whether they're Polish or German or whatever. 
well, how do we cope that? What's the mission of our church? Yeah. And that, that, that's why I end up with saying our mission is relationships and people to share with them the yeah. gospel of Christ. It's interesting. We often think of China as being sort of monolithic, sort of one country. But in some ways, it, it does bear some resemblance to Canada being a, a multiplicity of different peoples who are, you know, have different elements of culture. It's not just one culture, it's multiple cultures. And so that was oh, yeah. an interesting, interesting part of your work. Um, how, did, how did you broker all these different cultures that you were working with? I mean... Well, uh, the, the, the best thing I could could think of doing was was to give them a voice in the church here. Mm -hmm. So it formed this, uh, 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 well, what did we call it? Special interest conference? Yeah. C created a committee for them that met once a year. Okay. And they talked to each other. I see. Yeah. Okay. And, and and then and then tried to give them, encourage them in a presence at conventions. Yeah. So there'd be some recognition. Yeah. And how many? How like, many? It's interesting that you mentioned this because this is also what Estonians, Germans, Norwegians. That we, there were all these different conferences or groups of uh, based on culture. That were that came together periodically. What? Did, how many cultures did you have? Different cultures did you have in Western Canada at the time? You had Chinese, I assume, and you mentioned this yeah. the Germans. I'm sure. Who else? Yeah, almost too many to count. Yeah, including you, you, you Aboriginal peoples who mm. were also separated yeah. by their various cultures. Right, and it, it became very apparent that that how to get people together into a worshiping congregation when you've got all this different stuff to deal with. Yeah. And, you know, people don't always mix very easy yeah. unless they've got common troubles or... Yeah. Well, we're often, else. we're often kind of aware of our own differences to some extent. And, uh, oh, yeah, boy, at the time, at the time I was, you had a question about when I came as director of a mission in Western Canada. Yeah. It was apparent that Lutheranism in Canada was quite monolithic. Yeah. East was monolithic. Yeah. West was monolithic. Yeah. A bunch of white, a bunch of cowboy, mm -hmm. cowboy pietists. Mm -hmm. And how you pull it together, you have strict orders and structures as how the church is put together. Mm -hmm. And how do you get it together? And That's tricky business, isn't it? Because you came you came into that role just as Canada was experiencing a boom in diversity, weren't you? There was a lot of immigration and different communities. Yeah, the, 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 the Finns had just come. Yeah. So then there was a big Finnish immigration. How do we respond to that group? So had to develop relationships with the Church of Finland and try to get pastors. Yeah. And the same with the overseas church in, in Hong Kong and China, mm -hmm. how do we get Chinese pastors? Mm -hmm. So it meant building some relationships there. Yeah. And, and it was sure bigger than I was. Well, you were, but, you were probably someone well prepared for it by your background and being open to these different things and different cultures and different peoples and the importance and, and understanding the importance of building relationships obviously was central for you. So you were very strategically placed at the time. I think that's a, that's a very important thing. But I want to just change for a moment and ask the question about the three churches, because I know Lutheran, the, the, the three significant Lutheran denominations in Canada cooperated when it came to mission, right? Uh, the mission project, namely, mostly congregations, I should say, developing congregations. Was that significant in any way for the for the formation of the LCIC or Lutheran Unity? 
Why was that important to do? Uh, that was hard. That was tough slugging. Uh, but we, because we had to work at, you had, you had the anchor dragging all with the time. Yeah. The anchor was dragging it, and that was our, our respective histories and our, the, our, our, our theological bent be, be, be between conservatism and, and more liberal mm -hmm. thinking theology. And how do you do it with, with Luther Church Canada? It was very difficult. I'm not sure we're over that one yet. Yeah. But, uh, and then there were the Norwegians in the West under Hauge. It mm -hmm. was, was uh, a type of pietism that we should have gotten along well with, but it was... It was just used to thinking their way, and the Swedes were thinking of their liberal way. And anyway, it was a matter of finding a table we could sit at. Yeah. And so we did. We had a, a mission committee that was, we, we met, we, we, we met several times a year and, and it tried to do some strategizing mm -hmm. regarding development of new congregations. Mm -hmm. Well, that's okay because the model in all the churches was basically to build new congregations, mm -hmm. but something was pushing us off to the side mm -hmm. and that was the cost of congregations, right. the lack of pastors, Mm -hmm. And the diversity of our communities. Yeah. And so, how, how does this come together? So, we struggled with it. Yeah. We even, for, for, for my view, to develop congregations, we didn't have quite enough money. So, we had only $8 million in the, in the, in the, in the Canada section, mm -hmm. LCA. And that wasn't enough to buy property in a high, no. high cost. And I says, how in the world are we going to do that? Mm -hmm. and we developed a, and we couldn't get land because there was so much development across the country, particularly yeah. in the West, that you could get property. McBurry was coming on board mm -hmm. and the government owned all the land. So mm -hmm. you had to deal with the government. Mm -hmm. So we had to sit down as, not as Lutherans, but as multiple bodies right. and form a church planning committee yeah. in, in Alberta. Mm -hmm. So then we would negotiate for permission to buy property right. in the different developing areas. Mm -hmm. So, so know, there that was a... Was a Lutheran, there was a Lutheran committee, and then there was also a, a wider committee, you're saying, is that right? Correct? In Alberta, there was a wider committee. Yeah. And, and that was an, an attempt to just to the changing times and mm -hmm. social and economic patterns. Yeah. yeah. Uh, anyway, that was, 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 was dealing with that. It was somewhat helpful yeah. it didn't solve our money problem no. but uh that, that, well today uh, the, the cost of property is even even higher so i i, I think people it's, can it's even, even right yeah, so there's new preppers yeah there's and even pressures now, and the other thing we have to realize i think even today starting new congregations model of just having a new congregation for Lutherans is changing too. I know there's a lot of joint congregations. We have one here that's a, a United Church and a synagogue formed a, a built a, a project together and have used a, a same building kind of thing. So that sounds like Scout Town. Yeah. <laughs> In 85, Jim, you were appointed the director for the Division of Canadian Missions. Um, 
this was kind of a new venture for, for Lutherans in Canada. What were some of the early cha- challenges you faced in, in the new church and what the, were some of the challenges for this new staff team that had come together? Well, I, uh, to, to, to work with the monoliths. What are the monoliths? The monoliths. And that was our denominationalism, our theology position, and all those things we've talked about. Mm-hmm. They're, 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 their culture, mm-hmm. their establishment, mm-hmm. their, their synodical organization, mm-hmm. and all that. How do you how do you pull that together? That was a a, ch- a challenge, and I, one of my goals was to develop oneness in the in our Lutheran Church in Canada. Mm-hmm. I wanted to assist that mm-hmm. that task, but I had a I'm not sure I was the right person to to to, to work at that. We had World Mission. We had to. Canadian mission, we had the other divisions, and I couldn't do it. I couldn't do my job very well without help. So I got I got assistance in in each of the synods mm-hmm. to work, call them shared shared mission people in each synod mm-hmm. to help with what needed to be done there. Yeah, with local decisions and planning. Mm-hmm. And that was quite useful where we we had conferences and could feed yeah. information into the board and so on. So that was one method. The other thing was was just to spend time with people and mm-hmm. and, 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 and and attempt to build relationships. Mm-hmm. And we had all the resources of the of the LCA behind us. Mm -hmm. Uh, Those years I was in the director of mission, whether with the Senate or the the national church, we had sociologists, we had had people to help with finance, Mm -hmm. financing and and raising money. We had people to assist with the buying of, of real estate. We had a Department of Architecture for Mm -hmm. development of church buildings. Mm -hmm. And we had engineers who could help us with us. So we also had, we had programs we could send staff to, to Mm -hmm. for for, for updating and and, and developing their view. It was rich time. So this was this. These were programs that were uh, and support coming from the Lutheran Church in America in the states, and then the ELCA. Those later, the ELCA in the states. Yeah, and and, and they were so willing to help us. At one point, we were the ten. We were among the ten fastest growing synods in the whole North America. Really? Yeah. Uh, yeah. It was. It was. You would say it was good times, yeah. But the good times don't last forever. We know that. Yeah, that things have changed for sure in that regard. What were some of the when you were on the you were on the first staff? You were one of the first people in the national office in 1986, weren't you? I mean, you started right away, even before that, didn't you? Yeah, yeah. I started right away. I moved to Winnipeg in '85, yeah. and had to get my kids in school. Yeah, that all settled. And uh, and so then I had some cleanup work to do in mm-hmm. in the Western Senate, mm-hmm. and then I started to think about what's coming down the road and and get the office settled, uh, set up, and start to find some direction. Yeah, and that must have been an exciting time. Well, it was, but it's difficult because I, mean, I told you my background, where I come from, yeah. and I wasn't much of a of a, what you say, business organizer mm-hmm. to get a to, to, to get the institution yeah. flowing, but anyway, it worked at it. Good. And that's, and, that's uh, interesting. 
Um, so can you, can you, do you think, can you think of one or two of those in the early days, one, one or two mission projects or congregations that you thought were somewhat unique or special in a way? Were there some that stood out for you from that time? Well, I don't know. We talked about money. Money has always been a problem for the church. Right. They think it's the problem, but it's not. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's, it's that business of relationships with people, mm-hmm. whether whatever religion they are, because my son, who's a cab driver, says, well, Dad, didn't God make it all? So <laughs> don't we have the same God? Yeah. And, and I guess we sometimes get too exclusive in our, our self-definitions. Nineteen eighty-seven, mm-hmm. I was in the in the new office, and we were we were settled there. And uh, my family in Minnesota wanted to see Churchill. Mm-hmm. I said, "Well, I want to see Churchill too." So we planned a train trip with the members of our family, mm-hmm. of uh, my, my wife's sisters and brothers. And we went a train trip to Churchill. And that was a, a quite a trip. But in making that trip, I also read Norm Twyman, Trinan's uh, book about a, something, the history of Lutherans mm-hmm. and, and about the first Lutherans in Canada mm-hmm. and referred to, uh, what's his name? Ra- was it Rasmussen that went to Churchill? Yeah, yeah, Rasmussen. Rasmus uh, Jensen. Yeah, okay. Rasmus Jensen and and Jens Monk. Yeah. Jens Monk was the leader of the of the flotilla yeah. that was commanded by the king of Sweden, no, the yeah. king of Norway and the king of Denmark yeah. to find the Northwest Passage. And I remembered that story when we were up in Churchill. Well, it was interesting to go to Fort Churchill and stand there and look out across the waters and think about the, about that story. And later that week, I was, I was, I was walking on the beach. Well, the beach up there is not a nice sandy beach. It's just a bunch of rock. And I was walking along and thinking about the history of the place and what does Churchill mean for us and the mission of the church. And I saw this funny stone and I, 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 I thought, oh, that's different. Does that belong here? I should show it to you. I don't know what got it here somewhere. Anyway, so I walked on. And on the way back, I walked by the same stone. I walked right by it. And then I turned and looked at the stone and I said, that stone is talking to me. <laughs> so I picked the stone up and I looked at it. It yeah. was distinct. And so I asked the stone, where are you from? And that's what I got back was that pile of of layers, yeah, hundreds of years, yeah. And I thought, well, it's just about four hundred years since Rasmus Rasmus Jensen mm-hmm. and his gang went shipwrecked, yeah, up up here. Yeah. And I I thought about that, and this stone isn't even all carved round. Yeah. Oh, and so I put it in my backpack mm-hmm. and took it home and put it on my coffee table in the office in yeah. Winnipeg. And people would ask about the store. I'd say, well, that's a store that tells me, well, my job is. Yeah. <laughs> and I am a grimmigrant somewhere. I'm on the top of that layer. And like so many, yeah. So that's that was 
So it's a reminder for you of what, what, what Canada is about and what mission in Canada is all about. Right. Yeah. And I never forgot it, but then we got in this economic crisis in the church and, mm. and we needed more money to mm. do mission work. And they kept cutting our budget down to a third of what it was. Right. And well, then the threats were to, to disband the division for mission because it cost too much. Well, our property fund, which has eight million, started with eight million, ended up with over 12 million. Yeah. And the reason was I, I got on the phone one day and I called, what was his Walter name? Walter Hackborn. Yeah, Hackborn. And, and I called Harry Greb and I called a, a Jerry Rohr was a, mm. a builder and realtor in Winnipeg. And right. I said, could you guys come together? We need to sit down and talk about something. We need to talk about how to we, we settle our fundings. Mm -hmm. And so we did one day. The mm -hmm. guys were all caring. Yeah. They come and do it. Yeah. It's okay. Take your time. And, This, it was a nice relationship yeah. between them. Yeah. And they said, well, we need to develop incentives. And so we got a, a program put together mm -hmm. which helped to boost those congregations yeah. well, with incentives so they could manage the debt. And then we, we, would, we would have more resources. Yeah. And so... It's not always money. It's not always organization. Yeah. It's the it's the the will to do it. Yeah. And then, and you certainly brought a great deal of skill to that moment and uh, to that that whole process, Jim. This has been your life's work, hasn't it? Yeah. Yeah, it's a good thing. Um, <laughs> Do you, do you want to say, do you have any final words you want to offer to the, uh, to the, say, young pastors? What, what would you say to younger leaders in the church today about the importance of mission work for the church in Canada, the Lutheran Church in Canada? Do you have some, some advice for them or some wisdom you'd like to offer? Yeah, I don't think we need to go. We need a Jesus model. Yeah. Now, that sounds pietistic. Yeah. But it's really not. Yeah. It's like I saw the Anglican bishops in celebrating celebrating Easter mm -hmm. in, in in on a program I watch. And he was he was wearing his mitre and his robe and all the stuff. And he got in a pulpit and he says Nice to see you people who haven't been here for a year. And he says, I guess you came back because of all this Catholic stuff. And, and then he said, that's not what Easter is about. Yeah. And when he was walking in, he knelt at the altar yeah. and had all this fine, fine robe on. He was wearing sandals. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I thought, what a lesson. This guy is not just there for show, but in his heart, there's something else. Yeah, and he, that's important. I, I, I enjoy following his sermons because he's a Carmelite. Oh, really? It's a, po a poverty order. Yeah, yeah. And, and, but well, what comes through his, his preaching is that the fact is that the Holy Spirit guides us and changes us mm -hmm. more than anything else. Yeah. And, and that's kind of where, where, where we are today. Yeah. Or it's, it's like when I took a group to China and I said, well, 
you don't understand the Chinese people and culture. Let's get it a better understanding. So I took a dozen people over mm -hmm. and, and we did. And uh, Hong Kong, and we went from, from Hong Kong into Guangzhou. Yeah. And, and we were in Guangzhou, we, we, we called for a meeting of religious leaders. Yeah. And Don Schobert happened to be with us. He, he was on his way to Australia. And we, and we a missionary from, from Norway was, was at, at the Christian mission for Buddhists in, in Hong Kong. And he set the deal up for us. Mm -hmm. And we met with church leaders in, in Guangzhou and, and invited them for dinner. And, and, and members of the, the Communist Party who, who formed the, the council. And I said, we had a, I don't know, 12 course meal. It didn't cost us that much because mm -hmm. we shared that as we were there. Mm -hmm. And I said, well, you wonder why we invite you together. I said, it's because so many Chinese people are moving to Canada. Yeah. And we, we, we need to understand and appreciate yeah. their, their way of life and their culture. So I want each of you, if you would, to share with us something of, of, of your concern. Mm -hmm. And they, they were, there were Buddhists there, and the Roman Catholics were there, and the, and the, and the and the atheists and the Communist Party were there, and then they put a they they put an envelope on the table mm -hmm. in front of each one of us. I think we we're mm -hmm. I don't know eight or ten tables, and each one of us was in red lettering a, a nice invitation to breakfast the next morning oh. at Government House. Oh, really? Wow! Which was which was quite an honor. Sure and, was. And, and before our meal, the night before, Don Schoberg was there, and the missionary from 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 Norway says, "Well, your party, you can do what you want." So, <laughs> asked asked Don Schoberg to, to ask the blessing. So he did. Well, the next morning. A communist host asked Don Schoberg to, to, to offer the prayer for breakfast. Really? Wow. Isn't that interesting? And, and let me tell you something else. Okay. I know you're over time, but we were visiting each one of those church groups as a group to get acquainted with their, mm -hmm. their life and their culture and their religion. And we, it was a year that there was that invasion in Iraq. Right. If you remember. Mm -hmm. And Muslims were bad, Iraqis were bad, and it was a terrible mess mm -hmm. for discrimination against Muslim people in the U.S. Right. And the, the, the chairman of the, of the uh, Christian council in Guangzhou well, it was a Christian. Mm -hmm. And he, he, he brought us to the, to the place where the, the Muslims were mm -hmm. in their mosque. Yeah. It was one of the oldest ones in, in China. And knocked on the wooden door outside the wall and the door was answered and the imam came and and greeted us and and the the secretary took his hand and they walked arm in arm when he after he invited us in yeah. and 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 a in for tea and they walked arm in arm and I said to him afterwards I says what's with you guys I said, you act like old friends. He says, how could you not be an old friend mm -hmm. when you were in 
in the Chinese Revolution, mm -hmm. in a detention camp for 10 years. Yeah. We learned to know each other. Yeah. Interesting. Wow. What a story. So, uh, what a great story, Jim. That's, that's terrific. You know, um, I think I think we are going to bring this to a bit of a conclusion here. But well, I, I, well, I, there's there's too ahead. much too much there. So no, right. no, no. I could listen to you for much longer, but I know our time is limited, Jim. You know, on I, I think on behalf of everyone, I, one, one of the things that strikes me here about our conversation and about you is that you know I, I remember Pope Francis in another context. Um, said Christians don't build walls, they build bridges. And right. I think, you know, in a sense, you've been a real bridge builder, not only in Canada to, to develop mission congregations, but to develop those relationships that cross the boundaries we often impose on each other, boundaries of culture, boundaries, uh, boundaries of ethnicity and all those things. So on behalf of everyone, just to say what an honor it is to have a chance to talk to you, to listen to your service to the church, to your ministry. Thank you for all of that. You've been a gift to the church and a gift to Canada, and we appreciate it very much. So thanks, thanks, Jim, for this time. Well, thank you. Thank you. It's a pleasure to, to lie awake at night and say, what have I got to say about, about my life of mission? began very early. Yeah. And I hope it hasn't ended because I still cherish relationships yeah. with people and God's love, which we have to share. Yeah.